My name is Matt McKinney. I'm the co-chair of Penn State Startup Week, uh, powered by PNC. And uh, thank you for joining us on our, our final day of sessions here. Um, so on behalf of my co-chair, Nicole Singaloni, Invent Penn State, and the Student Executive Committee, um, we're just thrilled to have our next speaker here today, Asha Abalasha. She is the C e CEO, CEO, yeah. CEO <laughs> and founder of Mason Dixie Foods. Um, which is the fastest growing frozen convenient comfort foods company in the US. Uh, Asha created Mason Dixie Foods to offer better quality, clean label comfort food after realizing that most comfort food options were heavily processed. Um, and on a personal note, I first met Asha in 2015 uh, in Washington, DC um, when she was starting her business. And I just moved there to, to teach at Gallaudet University. And uh, back then you were selling one biscuit at a time. And I <laughs> approached Asha about doing collaborations with my classes um, that I was teaching in entrepreneurship. And for the last seven or eight years, Asha um, and Mason Dixie Foods have been amazing partners in my classrooms, uh, coming to give lectures, um, being business, uh, business pitch competition judges, um, mentoring my students. And hiring them and and yes, hiring <laughs> hiring my my best students um, for internships and summer jobs, uh, which just is a testament to their involvement in the community um, where they're at. And uh, so please help me welcome Asha Abalasha. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I know that sometimes these lanyard mics are a little funky on women's blouses, but uh, everyone can hear me. Good. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you guys for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I kind of don't really get the opportunity as a founder very often to talk about the, the journey because you're always looking forward when you start a product company or a fast growth company. Um, so it's kind of nice, it was nice to kind of build this deck in, in reflection of eight years of history in starting this business. And I kind of coined it the recipe for success um, in starting a startup because I do think there is a recipe. And everyone says it's a secret. It's not. Um, but I did it as a fun way to, to kind of commemorate what industry we're in, right? So we're in the frozen food and specifically the baking space. So to me, starting a successful startup is a lot like a, a true baking recipe, except really hard. And I'll tell you why. So, you know, first, every, every successful company that's been able to blossom, it really starts with you the founder, right? It really starts with you wanting more than anything. It's, it's in your lifeblood, it's, a, it's, a, it's beyond passion. So for me, I don't really know where it came from outside of when I really thought about my roots, right? I, I, I'm born of two immigrant parents. My dad was Palestinian Israeli and my mom was Korean. They met in a Jewish deli in Baltimore and then here I am. And they were always very entrepreneurial because they had to be. I think it's a pretty common American immigrant story. If you really think about it, I don't know how many of your parents might be, but um, it's that whole struggle, that whole come up, that whole, I didn't get to go to college or my college degree didn't transfer, right? So they had to start from whatever they could. Um, so when I grew up, they had a small corner store that my mom cleverly started serving comfort food out of because it was in a food desert. And she was like, you know what? I can make more money if I could just serve. It, they had this weird old deli counter thing and she like rigged it to, to kind of keep hot food warm. Um, and so her entrepreneurial spirit, I guess, was part, part of me and in me, um, but also being a half Asian, uh, first generation American, it was pounded into me that I needed to be the first one to go to college, pounded into me that I needed to be a doctor, a lawyer, probably the two professions my parents thought made a lot of money. So, you know, I, I was forced to kind of consider those paths, but in the end, I, I really hated them. So when I, when I got to college, um, it was a whole new world for me. Um, I grew up in a pretty uh, poor area. I grew up in public housing until I was 13 years old, and I didn't really know what to expect out of college. Everyone just said it's like high school 3.0. I think all of you have realized it is not high school 3.0, right? Like, it's a, it's a different level of experience. The exposure to the people you get is so different. Um, and I wasn't really prepared for that. And I don't really think in the end that I, I felt like I really assimilated into the college experience the way that a lot of other students did. Um, so I was really anxious to get out in the world and start working. So throughout my college experience, I worked four jobs at a time, you know, in a restaurant, 
work study positions, internships, um, true paid, you know, uh, salaried work from the US EPA to Toshiba. Um, and I was still unfulfilled. So then I went out on this whole journey, like we all do, we graduate, and I get these awesome jobs. I'd be out to LA, and I'm consulting for Microsoft and MGM Studios. And then I got pulled back into DC, working for a big five uh, uh, management consulting firm. And then I got recruited to work for Audi in my final stint in corporate America. I hated every hour. Um, it's one of those things, I think, when you realize you were built for something else. After almost 15 years of the grind, I was like, I feel like no matter how hard I run, I can't run up. It's always lateral. Um, you know, part of it is I think I was a female in very male-dominated places. Um, I didn't come from a pedigree, didn't come from Stanford or Harvard or all the fancy verds. And I didn't get the chance to really showcase my skills because there were always there was always a queue of other people who had been there longer and they deserve to have the director title more. Um, so I got tired of that. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm busting ass. I'm, I'm working so hard for who? And at the end of the day, I knew what I could accomplish. So I decided to drop everything and start my own business. And the idea for Mason Dixie came to me as, you know, so I was in DC at the time. This is around 2013, 14. There's a huge energy around entrepreneurial spirit at that time. A lot of us millennials were like, fed up and too smart for the, for the place. really focused on making natural food better, right? A better pizza, a better burger, a better, you know, a Mediterranean option versus only going out for burgers and fries, right? And in the end, you know, I settled on this idea that biscuits, right? Because here we are in America and the global image of American comfort food is a man in a clan outfit, a fake king, and a cow that hates, that wants you to eat chicken. And on top of that, you've got the, the fastest growing company with Chick-fil-A at the time. And it was also one of the most hate-filled companies, right? Super homophobic, uh, very bigoted company, um, especially back then. I know they're doing image cleanup, but sometimes legacy takes a long time to die. Um, and then you look at Popeye's, KFC. It was all filth, right? When you really look at the history of American comfort food, soul food, it was food made by slaves, um, plucked from the earth, put in a skillet, and served fresh, farm to table. And yet the global image of that food was gravy that looked like condensed mushroom soup, biscuits that were made with aluminum and tons of preservatives, chicken that's doused in potassium sorbate so that it looks pink longer. I mean, that's just that's what everyone was consuming. And I'm like, that's like the antithesis of what American comfort food is. So I wanted to change that. And I looked to examples, shining examples of people that have done well. And at that time, Panera was doing incredible. And what they did was centered everything around the bread. And if you guys, I think, are too young to remember when Subway first got started, but it was also a bread story. Um, so I decided that the most American thing on that menu outside of fried chicken was a biscuit. And it was the one thing that I knew needed to be cleaned up so much because the global image of it was still preservative late and it was still bigoted. It was still, the image of a biscuit was still Paula Dean, right? The world's evolved. Look at this room. I'm sure all of you have had a biscuit before. So that I wanted to change too. And so in the end, um, decided to really start thinking about what this would look like. And I wanted to make it a fun, familial experience. This is where Matt probably met us, right? When we first got our our chicken biscuits out, you know, where we were the first company to use organic, uh, antibiotic-free, hormone-free chicken, right, and fry it. And people are like, oh my God, is that natural? Okay, your alternative is still eating crap fried chicken, or you could have birds that aren't, you know, completely botched and have an amazing experience. It was also groundbreaking for us because I chose to open Mason Dixie in an area of town that most people wouldn't go. So, because I believe that food deserts, because I think about my mom, right, when I was thinking about that area, food deserts tend to be in areas where there are less affluent white people. And thus, the neighborhood we chose to locate in, the options were a Checkers, a Taco Bell, and a KFC, all within, there was four corners, and we were one of the corners. And obviously, it was an economically challenged area. It's right outside where Matt's um, old university used to be. And I just didn't think that sat right with me. I felt like people who were gonna eat this food the most deserved access to better versions of it, right? I, and, and it, we proved it. 
I think we grossed in our first nine months, $900,000. So for a fast casual restaurant, that's like almost 40% more than expected in a first year gross. We ran out of food for the first eight weeks. Like we literally had to shut the restaurant down at like two because we couldn't get enough food in there. Um, and there's a thing, there's, a, there's, an, there's an impressive thing about that, right? Because people started to learn good food can't always be around. Slow food takes time. And retraining that into society was something really interesting. Um, and I didn't really know that that was going to take off. But I, I, just, I just had this hunch, right? And when people ask, well, how did that happen? How did you get all those people? Like we had lines for two miles. And people lined up three hours before we opened. They slept in our parking lot. Um, and I thought about it. And I was like, well, what, what did we do right there? And I think a lot of the times it's so easy to say, I'm a food concept. I'm only going to rely on other food concept success uh, uh, metrics, right? I'm going to look at what they did because I want to be like N Pizza, or I want to look at th what they did because I want to be just like, you know, Kava. And the reality is, then you're just doing more of the same. You're not really cutting edge. I came from before I was at Audi. I was in tech. I told you I consulted for Microsoft, um, MGM on their like tech side. I actually was part of the um, Transformers first movie. We had life-size robots we had to put up in LA. It was pretty nuts. Um, but it was all tech related, right? And I was like, okay, so I'd always been up on the software scene. And this is where I think it's also important as an entrepreneur, as a founder, to always be thinking about everything you're learning and how it could apply, how it could apply to your business. So one of the things that was happening when I first started Mason Dixie was Kickstarter was coming onto the scene. All of you guys know what Kickstarter is now. Back then, it was basically 1-800-MY-IDEA as a website. It was mostly made for inventions, despite what the narrative is today. We were the second food concept on that website. And everyone was like, oh, how do you fit the food in there? You know, it's like, this is supposed to be for like gadgets and gizmos and service companies things. And it was, it was interesting because you just jerry, we just jerry rigged it, right? I just put like food porn of all these like big biscuits and fried chicken crumbs everywhere. And like people were smiling, right? And I was just staying up on the algorithm and the SEO really picked up. I mean, that's what Kickstarter is so amazing for. It's the amount of traffic it generates so quickly. Same thing with Facebook and Twitter. There wasn't even a real Instagram presence back then for food. It was still a fashion site. So we had to leverage the tools we had. Facebook was interesting, and the business page was new back then. Twitter still had the, what was it, 40-character limit. But it was very localized and very viral. Everything's changed now. But back then, it was really easy to get traction just by staying on top of it, by commenting, by replying back to customers that were asking about where we were going to be next. And then on top of that, the creativeness around being on Kickstarter, on Facebook and Twitter, as often as we were as a food brand, doing pop-ups all over the city in the weirdest places, like gelato factories and people's parking lots. This was all new back then. And so we got the attention very early of a company from Korea that had re recently been purchased by Uber. And it became Uber Eats, but it was actually a Korean company that started by serving hot mom's made meals. So she'd make some really great bibimbap, put it in a bag, and some guy would pick it up and send it to a guy at a business building because he really craved going home to eat, but they were working 18-hour days. That idea got bought by Uber, and they wanted to bring it to America, and they needed to find a company that was going to pilot it. Obviously, they knew we were scrappy because they saw the social content about us being able to serve fried chicken biscuits out of a parking lot with no technology. But they also saw that we were willing to do whatever it took to make the business happen. So they asked us to participate in a pilot, and they wanted to know if we could make 6,000 sandwiches in three hours. I said, yeah. Everyone looked at me like I was crazy. We did it, though. We had 12 people, 12 tables. We were punching them out. Like, minute after minute, we were filling up these big black bags. They were taking them out to the world, and that's how Uber Eats started. So it was really interesting that it started with us as a pilot in D.C. And then even on top of that, at the same time, everyone's watched that WeWork documentary. He is very much like that. But the founder of WeWork and his marketing team found us again on social, again, because we were doing a lot of tech things. And they wanted to really create a tech hub for a lot of like the Politico style service industry tech people that were coming out of DC at the time. So their first WeWork in DC was recruiting all that talent. And they were like, these are nerds. They're not social. You guys make it cool. Can you make our parties cool? Can you make people love being here at the office? And we were like, sure. So we brought food. We brought cool people. 
bartenders, right? All of our industry friends, and we really blew up their whole concept and ended up making that vibe that WeWork was really trying to do. So I think partnerships, sticking to being like the local brand, right? Working on how to plug yourself into the biggest thriving communities, which at the time, like I said, were tech. That really, I think, put us in a different realm, even though we were still one tiny restaurant in one tiny city. So as the restaurant was going, we were selling a food. I was like, crap, what are we going to do when we sell out of food? This is embarrassing. But you know, when you're growing natural chickens, there's only so many of them sometimes, right? So the one thing we always had access to was the ability to make biscuits. So at some point I said, you know what? Let's just keep making these biscuits. Let's start freezing them. And let's start putting them in a bag and selling them instead of t-shirts and IOUs, right? Because we were like couponing the hell out of people because we were running out of food. And so you can see in the top uh, right corner. That was our first iteration. I went to Bed Bath and Beyond in a in a you know sorrow filled stupor because I didn't have enough food for that first big opening day. I ran to Bed Bath Beyond. I got this hundred dollar food saver machine, and until four o'clock in the morning, in heels this high because I'd just come out of like a business meeting. I'm sitting there vacuum sealing six packs of frozen biscuit pucks, and the, my my chef at the time was like, "You're nuts. This is stupid." It's not fresh that way. And I'm like, well, why isn't it fresh? I took it right off your, you know, your cutter and I put it in this bag and I froze it. And you know what? They rose so beautifully, consistently, that I was like, all right, we're onto something here. Because when I started baking off the Pillsbury pucks, they were like this big. Ours were like this big. And on top of that, it allowed us to really make more food because we could get ahead of making tons more biscuits at night now, freezing them. And in the morning, we could bake them off. So we didn't have to start at 4 a.m. And whatever we could produce before seven was all we could make. So it was transformational to the restaurant business, but then never did I imagine. I got invited to this party called Emporium, and it was like hosted by Shake Shack when you know um, the group that owned them was like doing a lot of promotions. They basically had all these cool brands in a, in a big room. No utilities, nothing. I didn't know that until I got there because we had this whole plan. We we're going to sell all these chicken biscuits. We're going to partner with Shake Shack. It would be so cool. And literally, they gave us a table with no electrical outlet, no water, nothing. So we were like, okay, hot food's out. I told the team, go back, grab all the frozen pucks that we've got out there. Let's sell these frozen biscuits here. Never in a million years did I think that would change my life. That small, weird idea completely changed the course of everything we do now. Because that day, we got discovered by a woman from Whole Foods. She wanted to kind of change the image that Whole Foods had had at the time, that it was exclusive to organic living people. They call them the Canyon Ranch people, right? They wanted to open up Whole Foods to be more approachable to the greater market, and they realized they were missing a lot of things. So their frozen bread door, for example, was all dietary. It was all keto or gluten-free. They didn't have normal staples that other grocery stores did because they were dirty. And then here we are. They asked me how many ingredients are in the biscuits. I said seven. And lo and behold, we got on the shelf the day before Thanksgiving in 2015, and we sold over 300 units in just three hours. So that was wild. It went viral through the whole Whole Foods ecosystem, and all of a sudden, I found myself with a restaurant that was growing like hotcakes. We couldn't even make enough food. And at the same time, we had this growing consumer brand that would went from one store to 23 in literally one week, and then 200 within a year. And I didn't know what we were going to do. I was like, is this, is this even worth it? So a year goes by. We kind of repackaged things. We focused on you know, the brand just locally. And then I'd rec I recruited, um, you may have heard him in some of the other chats, um, our CEO, Ross. And Ross was like, you know, if we're going to do this, we should try to see if this will work in the South, right? If the biscuit country people won't eat it, then we should just call it a day and focus on the restaurant. Great idea. So... Some, by some miracle, we got into a bunch of stores. We got into 2,000 stores in 2018, and it worked. It just blew up. And it was different at the time because before that, we were making the biscuits in the back of the drive-thru and packaging them up, put them in this, like, reefer trailer on the parking lot and then going out and delivering them, and it was easy. Well, when you go from 200 to 2,000, you can't make enough. Like, we couldn't make enough. So ended up having to find a co-manufacturer, negotiating on purchasing equipment, figuring out how we were going to scale the packaging line. And eventually, you know, we grew the business so much that we were in over 8,000 stores by 2020. 
and oops, sorry. We were so we were so excited, right? Like this was not a planned business. So imagine that you're a restaurant and you're selling t-shirts and all of a sudden your t-shirts are out selling your biscuits, right? Like you're like, what the heck's going on here? And that meteoric rise was something that was really hard to keep up because the second those 2000 stores came in, I couldn't self-fund it anymore. And that's something else I'll tell you. I think it's really important not to, to get hooked on that drug of thinking that the only way to finance your business is through venture capital and the money markets. It's really important to see how far you can go as a founder, how much you can squeeze out of yourself. Because the second you get hooked onto that, the needs and the desires of investors trump everything you want to do. If you wanted to grow slower, if you wanted to be profitable, if you wanted to launch a new line, you now have an external stakeholder that's going, I don't know about that. Or, you know what, that's a great idea. We need to raise $10 million more million. And all of a sudden, your 80% goes down to 20% because their idea trumped yours, right? So I think it's, you have to be careful, and I, I knew that. So I tried to hold on as much as I could. Every day for four years, we held on until we couldn't hold on anymore. So we had to take investment. And in that search for investment, I was like, I don't even know how to get started. I, I, again, child born of immigrants, one of the first things my parents said, don't ever take other people's money. So in my mind, I'm like, shit, how am I going to do this? We need millions of dollars. This is going to be crazy. Like, how are we going to do this? And luckily enough, um, I applied to the Chobani incubator at the time. So Chobani was really interesting. They believed in natural foods. They believed in growing the number of diverse brands in this consumer segment. And so they started like an incubator um, uh, that basically allowed 10 to 12 businesses a year to get one-on-one -on -one mentorship, insider knowledge, um, practiced help from hundreds of employees. I mean, it was transformational. But it also told me that my gut about not trying to chase after investment um, and investors in the venture capital market versus private investors, it really taught me the value of that because the founder of Chibani actually bought his company back from investors because he didn't like what was going on. So I knew it was okay. And it let me lead the narrative of picking a partner through the narrative of, I want somebody who has my values, okay? So this is 2019. Then comes 2020, and this crazy-ass pandemic hits, and it blows everything out of the water. The restaurant was on its knees because we were located next to a college university um, and by a hospital, and there's just not enough foot traffic because everyone was scared of dying, right? Um, and I was scared for my team. Like, I didn't want my team members at that restaurant to die from this disease nobody knew about, so we were keeping very limited hours. It was really hard to figure out how to market the online system quick enough at the same time, the frozen biscuit business was booming, booming. In 2020, we grew 400%, and it was a lot. Because remember, couldn't even go to the manufacturer to be like, are you guys okay? Do you have enough stuff? I couldn't even see the products coming off the line because we weren't allowed to travel. I couldn't talk to anybody face to face to be like, are you mentally okay, right? We, all of our team, we were all together for such a long time, and all of a sudden, we were all separated. So it was really tough. But it was also a time where, again, I go back to that Chobani moment because the values were everything. That time, 400%, we needed cash so badly. So raising money, imagine, virtually, with investors you've never physically met, talking about, I care about my people, and you're not going to tell me what to do. That was literally my narrative when I raised capital. It's not normal, <laughs> especially not for a woman of color in the space where less than 2% of all venture capital funds go to women of color, let alone women. Um, so I ended up not even getting a dollar from venture capital because they didn't like what I said. They didn't like that I said, I don't believe in selling my values for cash. And so I ended up finding a value-based network of private investors that love the mission, love that it was woman-owned, love that our company is super diverse. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Because in the midst of growing the consumer business, post-pandemic, actually not post, but it was 2021, um, in the middle of the pandemic, we get a call from Whole Foods again. Hey, this plant-based stuff we're selling is not selling. We need something with meat in it. I know you guys have been growing like crazy, so you have capacity. Could you make a sandwich? You know, yeah. In the middle of the pandemic, hadn't talked to a meat manufacturer, an egg manufacturer before. We were so lucky because there was so much capacity at the time, right? Because the whole hospitality 
restaurant industry was shut down. So all these people that were making all this product for McDonald's, for you know, Bob Evans, for all these, they had plenty of capacity. They were, they were begging for business. And here comes this tiny little biscuit brand that could saying, hey, you guys got pork sausage that's natural? Hey, do you have cage-free eggs? Hey, do you have natural stuff that I could use? And they're like, yeah, yeah, what do you need? So it was the perfect time to partner on this. And lo and behold, we launched this whole campaign with this new sandwich at Whole Foods, and it took off. So for a frame of reference, um, potato chips are some of the fastest churning items in a grocery store. It's typically like 30 to 50 units a week at a minimum per SKU that goes through the register. We were doing 75 units a week of sandwiches at Whole Foods. So doubling what a potato chip does. That does not happen in frozen. In frozen, you're hoping for two a week. So it was crazy. It grew like wildfire. So here I am again. I convinced these poor little investors on this girl that is mission-based and values-based to give me $2 million. And literally within the year, I'm like, help, help. We need more money. So ended up needing to raise a lot of capital. And I could have gone back again and hit up those VCs because we had the best narrative, right? We had the best growth story. We had done so well. Our numbers were top of the charts. It's the perfect time to convince an institutional investor to give us cash. Instead, I said, no, I'm going to go back to the people that accepted me for me the first time. I'm going to go back to the people that believed in me when I didn't have anything to show. I'm going to go back to the people that were there for me in the middle of a pandemic when I was trying to tell them that we were going to grow 400%, and it was like, how? While a restaurant was shutting down. And lo and behold, that same network of people jumped on board. And they're like, yeah, I want to do it. I want to do it. And I said, hang on. This is going to put me over now because we need so much cash. I won't be the majority owner. We're woman-owned certified. And that's really important to me, and it's really important to our consumers. So what are you going to do about it? Because this is going to be really hard. Most of my investors at the time were guys. And they were like, well, we just got to find some women. And they went and asked their wives, their daughters, their friends, some of the most successful women they knew in business um, to invest, and all of them had. So here we go. I got to keep this majority women-owned status. I got to keep my values in place. I got a fuck ton of cash to keep the business going. And on top of that, the, the company was just burgeoning. And one of the things I think I'm most proud of, I don't know what's happening with this chart because none of the text, oh, you know why? I didn't know that I made this really dumb. Um, I was really proud because at this burgeoning time, right, growing 400% year over year, so was our team. So in the middle of a pandemic, we only had like seven people. And then by the end of last year, we were already at 25. And that's a big jump for a typical consumer brand and its growth trajectory. But what I was more proud of what was happening. So in 2020, obviously beyond the pandemic happening, we had the social justice movement at its peak. And at some point, I don't know how, I guess, again, because I'm one of the few women of color that's in the space and gets press, somebody asked me if I would help start a nonprofit. So I was like, what's this about? And this was right before the murder of George Floyd, actually. It was a, at a just kind of a weird time where everyone was kind of getting more woke about what was going on in the world, but no one was really putting any, anything behind it. Just a lot of anger, but not a lot of results yet. And I, I teamed up with two other founders of color, and they said, let's, let's create this company called Project Potluck, uh, or a nonprofit. And the whole purpose was to bring visibility, access, community, resources, mentorship to people of color in this industry. And hell yeah, sign me up, right? Our goal was to get 20 members, right? Because there's barely any of us. And murder of George Floyd happens. Wave of consciousness happens. All of a sudden, the three of us found ourselves at the top of this like figurehead search for people of color and industries doing something. All of a sudden, that spreads like wildfire. We're on every media outlet. We had this hope for 20 members. We had over 1,000 within three months. And from that effort, the littlest thing that I never thought would happen happened. And it was, here we are, we're recruiting for talent at Mason Dixie, not at Project Potluck. And I'm getting emails on LinkedIn, personal emails. People are finding my email address everywhere. And they're going, I hate my job. I hate the principles that my company stands for. I want to work for a woman. Or I want to work for a company that believes in a diverse uh, team base. And basically, every person you see on that screen was recruited because of the effort of wanting to belong somewhere. So I almost didn't, I actually didn't use a single recruiter ever. All of those people wanted to join Mason Dixie more than anything to belong. 
And I think that's one of the most proud things that I feel as an entrepreneur that I never really expected. I've always been somebody who's ride or die for my team. Maybe it's like a motherly instinct that women have. I don't know. But when I started to see what was going on, it was more than that to me. It was that I was building a company that looked and acted the way I wished more companies would, right? This is the fabric of America. We're 40% diverse now, and yet marketing is still skewed at 90% to white male Americans. Purchase decisions are 80% made by women in this country, and yet purchasing power still is held by a male's perspective. So I'm really proud to say that 83% of our company is diverse, uh, over 65% female, over 40% um, BIPOC, 10% LGBTQ. The whole point is to get our company thinking like the consumer. The decisions that we make are what our consumer would do. And I think that's a really progressive thing that I think needs to happen more in the industry, but I'm, I'm proud that we're first to do it. Um, and then it just kind of brings me to like where we are today. You know, we've grown so, so much. We're increasing product lines. Um, we're launching a new chicken waffle into the, into the set. So if you're near Whole Foods, please, please, please try it out. We're actually launching at Giant Martins too. I think there's some in this area as well. Um, but we're growing so quickly. And even last year, we actually launched a partnership with Marriott. We're in over 3,700 locations because they wanted to clean up their breakfast act too. So I think what's really been exciting is not only has the company kind of been a change for how we look at food, natural foods, it's a change for how we view breakfast, it's a change in how we view frozen food, and it's a change in how we view companies and what they could look like. So some of the most proud things that I think, you know, I've been really excited to be a part of as an entrepreneur. Um, so I wanted to close with just some lessons, because, you know, it's a university, so I feel like I've got to give you lessons. Um, so some things I would like to highlight, I know I just harped on this a lot, but, you know, the search for talent is one of the most critical functions as an entrepreneur in your journey. You've got to surround yourself with great people. But I think you have to be creative in thinking about what that means. It does not necessarily mean you're looking for a Harvard degree in consumer product management. You are not looking for an ace chef who's been the best maker of vegan sausage. You've got to look for people that believe in you, in your message in who you identify as, and what you stand for in the product. People today are purchasing with their mission first, their values first. They're not purchasing based on how hot something looks like. Yes, they will. They always will be. Flash will always be there, but it doesn't last. Okay, mission does. So really think about what you want to represent, how and what culture you want to build as a team. Because think about it, I probably work, I don't know, 16 hours a day because you're always on, you're always thinking, you're always doing. So you've got to ask yourself, like, what, who do I want to be surrounded by for 16 hours a day? That's a really important way to think about your entrepreneurship journey, because you're, you're, you're with them. For eight years now, I've been with these people around me all the time. Um, I think also look for natural leaders, right? When you're early and you're trying to start a business, you can't do everything. You're going to have to give the things away that you're not good at to somebody else. And you have to be really self-reflective and say, I suck at this, but I'm really good at this, right? Who are the amazing people that are, you're going to sit 16 hours a day with that you believe can wholly own something that you're not going to touch for a while, right? And don't get hung up on money. You'd be surprised. When I recruited Ross, he did it for $12 an hour and a promise for equity because I didn't even have the wherewithal to figure out how that was going to work yet. And his work ethic, his drive, the growth of the company allowed him to become a partner, right? There are other people, though, that I've paid a lot of money, like top of the stack, top, top tier talent. And I'm always like, Jesus Christ, that's what you get paid? I'm like, what am I doing wrong, right? You get paid more than me. But that's also OK, because sometimes you're going to need that person. I have the, the industry's foremost expert on natural chemical leavening, because she is a boss. She is the person, whenever Kellogg sues General Mills and General Mills sues Quaker Oats, she's constantly the person that has to sit on both sides because she's the one expert that understands everything. And I have her on my team because she's that important to me. So you have to think about who are the people that need to be around you, who are the people that are going to concede, and who are the people that you just need to buy, right? Think about it that way. I think the other thing that's also important is thinking scrappy. 
again, like I said, I think especially in the consumer products industry, it's a race to get venture capital. And the venture capital guys, don't forget, they're fucking rich, right? They're living on boats. They don't care about cash. They don't even look at the check, right? So like for them, they're like cash is no problem. Also, it's not their money. This is your money. This is your business. This is your equity. Every dollar counts. You have to build a culture of think, second guessing. Do we need to spend on that or can we do it cheaper? Um, it's, a, it's a joke, but it's not a joke. I think Airbnb exists because of us, because when we started the business, right, this is raw dough. And when you go to a grocery store for a meeting, it's a 20 minute meeting and they don't even taste the product because they just look at the box and they throw it in the back of the freezer and you hope to God they remember you. No, I come from hospitality. I came packing heat. I had all these biscuits cooked up, big ass tray of them because I left some with the admin assistant. I went around the offices when I wasn't supposed to and I'd leave biscuits around so people could try them. So that way you were the talk of the office and then we got really good traction because even if the buyer wasn't going to try it, everyone did and everyone was talking about it. Giant has been an incredible partner because they did that for us. They allowed us to do illegal things like drop biscuits off of people's desks, right? But that was scrappy thinking because there was no other way to cook this stuff, right? We're driving all the way to Pennsylvania from DC at the time. There was no way to cook these biscuits fresh and bring them up. So we had to find a place where we'd cook them. So we got Airbnbs and used the ovens. It was like the most impractical thinking because this, again, remember, this was a time when those were supposed to be vacation homes. And here we were using them as business meeting spaces, right? Like, like a, a tool to, to cook off biscuits and sell them. So think about the people that are willing to stay in an Airbnb with you, right? Think about the people that are not there for flash that don't need to stay somewhere because they get points there, right? I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but when you enter into the working world, that is 90% of America. Their goal is to be a, a platinum member of, of Bonvoy, okay? I'm not, I don't care, right? I'll sleep on the floor. Ross and I have, have um, uh, what's it called when you like, your head and your feet, tip, tail, whatever it is. We've slept in the same twin size bed with my feet in his face his feet in my face, because we cared about the business. It was all about the business. So think about that as you guys really think about spending. Um, pricing, this is a big one, because people think it's an art. It is not an art, it is math. It's simple math. What does it cost? How much do you need to operate? What is the healthy profit that's gonna carry the growth the next year? It's a simple formula that people constantly forget, because they go, well, what's so-and-so charging? We should be cheaper. What's so and so charging? How much are you getting for that? We should offer more, right? That is not how pricing works. And you'd be surprised, even to this day, the number of colleagues that I know that are running businesses in the tens of millions of dollars that have like a 4% gross margin, right? The beverage industry is notorious for this. They just want to blast out the next C4. And they go out and they spend hundreds of millions of dollars. The water company, Liquid Death hundreds of millions of dollars because they want to get dollar cans of water out, but they're netting a negative profit. It's really important that you guys understand, especially in the economic environment that you're going to be growing businesses in, that's not going to work anymore. Not for a long time. You've got to be generating profit, if, even if it means you only did 50,000 in sales. So always think about that. You know, that's business 101, right? Be smart about marketing your business. I told you some innovative ways that we did it early, right? Because we looked at the tech industry and all these cool apps and softwares and activities happening, and it really changed the face of our business. I don't even know what you guys are going to get into. Your whole world's so different than eight years ago when I got started, right? I don't even know what the TikTok verse is doing with product. I don't even know what ChatGPT is going to do for the consumer space. Get creative. Do it. You never know what's gonna happen. First to market on marketing, I think is critical. I also think you have to be smart about it, right? Again, the consumer industry, I just gave a big example, like beverage companies spend more on marketing than anything else. And that's a strategy, but I don't think it fits every product, every industry segment, certainly not frozen. I can't buy my way into an account. I can't buy my way into a consumer's freezer. So really be smart about what the objective of your marketing is and really make sure you know what results you're trying to get. Is it brand awareness? Is it dollar sales growth? Those are two different strategies you're gonna be spending on. So be really conscious of that. I also think it's really important to not forget to focus on your core business. It gets really easy to get distracted, okay? 
I'm the prime example of that. Started a biscuit company when I was really starting a restaurant. It's really easy to get distracted, so you have to make sure you can handle it. I'm not saying the offshoots are not a great idea, but sometimes it's all about what you want to do. One thing that happens when you're successful too, like we get this all the time from retailers, we love your products so much. Can you make them gluten-free? Well, no, it's against the premise of what we stand for because we don't want to add additives and bonding agents to the food to make it gluten-free when there are natural ways to make things fries and adhere, right? So, but I could easily go, yeah, I'll do it for the account. People do it all the time. And when you start doing that, you start sacrificing your values and your consumer goes, well, what are they doing now, right? I think there was a famous example, I can't remember what makeup company it was, but they were marketing that they were a vegan making co makeup company and then it came out that they were testing on animals, right? Like, okay, yeah, the ingredients are vegan, but they're still putting it on rabbits, so like, what are we doing here, right? Be very conscious, like, our generation of consumers will find out, okay? Don't get distracted by opportunities and ways to do things. And the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is, not all ideas are good ideas. It gets really easy as a founder to like start drinking your own Kool-Aid, trust me. You gotta surround yourself with people that go, that's a horrible idea, Asha, please stop, right? You gotta have the people that are gonna talk some sense into you. Because sometimes that trajectory, when you're a founder of influence, people follow you and they will do whatever you say. They will go and figure out how to make that thing that's not gonna make any money or be devastating to the business, or be a super distraction, right? So it's all about starting to put some foundations around what you're going to launch. Prime example, um, I wanted to launch cinnamon rolls and scones, and we did in the middle of the pandemic, and they were great items. Incre they're probably the best items we've ever made. But bad time, distribution was a nightmare, supply chain was a nightmare, the, the bakery we used to make them shut down because of, they just ran rampant with COVID and they couldn't even get back up. Should I have launched that innovation when I did and pushed the team as hard as I did to do it because I believe in the item so much? Probably not in hindsight. Maybe it was a bad time to launch an item because now all I get is sad emails from consumers that say, when are you bringing the scones back? They were the most amazing. And it's like, you know, it's all gut-wrenching to look at that and go, what did I do? Why did I do that, right? So it's all about doing the research, right? It's about goal setting. It's about thinking about who the target consumer is. Can you even do it, right? Is there a budget for it? Do you have the resources to do it? People, manufacturing, machine. Um, and do you have the time to trial it? I can't emphasize that enough. I had a really great conversation with a graduate from Penn State just a couple hours ago. And the big takeaway for her, she wants to launch a, a Momo company. And the big takeaway from our conversation was like, I think I, I, think I need to go to the farmer's market and start making it, and have people try it. Yes, great idea, right? Don't forget that. People get so caught up in the deck, the PowerPoint deck and the pitch, they forget people need to try it. Like, they wanna know if it's gonna be good, right? And don't, don't forget, it's always, as I mentioned in the beginning of the chat, like it's always a pleasure to be able to think retrospectively about all the things that have happened to me in the last eight years. Because as a founder in a fast growth company, all you're always doing is looking forward. You don't stop, you just keep running ahead. It's something you have to learn to stop doing because you have to really stop and analyze what worked, what didn't work, how would I make it better? There's no such thing as the perfect product. There's always gotta be a, in the auto industry, we call them product improvement plans, PIPs. Every year there was a product improvement for something. Your stuff is not perfect. It will always need to change. So never stop analyzing, never stop resetting, never stop challenging your best thing because you wanna keep up with the market keep up with consumer expectations and exceed them, right? So those are just quick flybys. Hopefully you guys absorbed some of it. I left a decent chunk of time for questions because I wanted to make sure, um, as it is a university, that I'm sure you guys are working on really cool ideas that I was able to address any of that. So I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was so nice. Um, I have a lot of questions, so I'll start with my first. Um, between uh, 2014 to 2020, right? Uh, between when you started to Series A, uh, how did you keep your, yourself afloat? Uh, what was uh, income your wise? Uh, income wise uh, and uh, profit wise, basically. So when I started the business, I had a chunk of savings that I applied to it. But I think it's a, that's a really good question, actually, because now that I think about it, 
what I did back then doesn't seem so innovative to you guys now because it's a mainstream thing, but back when I did this, pop-ups did not exist. So when I went to a landlord to be like, hey, this is an empty building, can I just like throw a party in it and have food? They'd be like, no, you know, like that's against code regulation. You can't do that, right? So I had to get really creative and that's why the first place we popped up in was the back of a gelato factory because he had this cool um, coffee lab. It was a Stumptown coffee lab. It was a training place because he served coffee and gelato in his coffee shops. But the, the place he made the gelato in was just a factory. So we popped up in the back. I, I wanted to start small because I could have gone out, you know, average restaurant build in DC costs a million dollars. So I did not have that kind of money, right? So I was like, we got to prove ourselves first and then maybe with enough traction, growing that cash pile, we could put that down on a payment and figure out how to do this. So when we started with the first pop-up, every dollar that came out of that thing went right back into the savings fund to start the restaurant. And we always did things not the shiny new way. We always took advantage of partnerships of, so our first drive through restaurant, our first physical location. So, so first, we did these pop-ups, saved all the money. And then all the traction got us into a 10 by 10 food hall, actually eight by 10 because there was a column in the middle of it. So a, a 10 by 10 stall and a small commercial kitchen. Could still afford that on the savings I had. All the cash that was coming out of it, banking it again. And then that drive through restaurant came up on accident. It was a Wendy's that burnt down. And everyone was like, oh, don't touch that with a 10 foot pole. It's in a poor area. No one's gonna buy your expensive ass biscuits. Don't, don't think about going there. And we did because it was turnkey, right? It burnt down, but it burnt down in the cosmetic bits. The kitchen, all that stuff was intact. It was in perfect shape for the most expensive parts of a restaurant. So it wasn't pretty. Like it wasn't as flashy as Sweet Green is, right? But it was cute. And we did it with paint. And we did it with cool graffiti artists that came in and made it look fun. And we got cheap furniture that we found online at eBay, right? Like we really were scrappy about building it so that we could afford it on our own. And when the frozen um, bis uh, business started growing, we were literally using all the restaurant cash flows to finance that business. And so that's why I was saying in 2020, when it rocketed up, really what we realized is we couldn't finance more than a million in cash because that's what the restaurant was generating, right? So that's when we had to take investment in because at that point, I just didn't have the equity in the restaurant business to really draw upon that cash to start it. Does that make sense? Asha, we have a Zoom question about um, pricing. It's a, it's a long question. Okay, yeah. um, so good. Do you Somebody think, was listening. <laughs> perfect. Do you think you were able to price your products using your formula and not comparing prices against your competitors because you were a very different breakpoint product and first to market in your category? So for heavily heavily competitive categories, would you recommend following the standard path to pricing with comparing against the competition or not? That's a great question. So first to answer our pricing strategy, just our first biscuit at Whole Foods was 10.99 for six. So, I mean, it wasn't meant for the average consumer, but I used the model, right? I said, this is what it costs. Very expensive because two humans were making them all the time and we could only afford to buy 200 boxes at a time, you know, like it was tough. So we really had to make sure we recoup the costs and we had enough margin in there to be able to continue growing. Um, so there was a huge margin in that business at the time. And was that competitive to get out of Whole Foods? No. Was there brand cachet about being highly differentiated? Yes. I think that was successful for as long as it could be. But then what I did, second part of your question is great, what I did was I did start to look at what the thresholds for people's spending were. And so we surveyed a bunch of our restaurant customers. We said, hey guys, how much would you pay for Mason Dixie biscuits? Because today they're $10.99 at Whole Foods. Again, we didn't charge $10.99. This is what happens. You got to remember too. In, in, in retail, there's what you charge, what the person who's going to deliver it to the store charges, and what the store charges. So it's getting marked up twice. And not just marked up, margined up. It's a very different calculation. So when we started looking at that math and seeing how when we were growing, we would not be price competitive because if we were in Kroger, it was going to be like $12.99 because it was just a more expensive margin scale that they, were, they wanted to put on that thing. So we had to really look and see how we were going to reduce costs. And that's where that manufacturing conversation came in. Like how could we make this more efficient? And in the end, when we did that consumer survey, we looked at the um, 
margin equivalents in the category, the price points for natural items. Remember, we were the first one to be natural in that category and everything was dog shit, right? So they were all like $2. It was like, we're never gonna be $2, so we can't look at that. So we had to look at other categories like beverage, ice cream was one of the categories we looked at because all the bougie ice creams are like 10 bucks, like Jenny's was $11 at the time. And then all the other ice creams were like $3.99. So we were like, okay, what is that threshold? And we settled on this magical break point at like $5.99 is this do not cross threshold for that category. So that's where we kind of settled in. I think it's important that you start by making money you will always find ways to come down because you'll get bigger and bigger scale means less cost. But start knowing that your first foundational customers don't care about the price, they care about you, they care about the mission, and they care about the product. So focus on those first, price it to win in terms of making sure you don't go broke, and then always find ways to margin optimize and cost optimize on shelf. Hopefully that answered their question. <laughs> oh yeah. So, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very inspiring. Thank uh, you. So, my question is that how did you deal with the aspects which you did not knew of? Like you have 15 years of experience in consulting and tech and marketing, but what about other factors like scalability or manufacturing or handling people? How did you deal with all those aspects? Because as a CEO, you need to like look at 10 or 15 different aspects, and yeah. it to be like not expert, but like semi-expert in all of them? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think to be a good CEO, you have to know enough to be dangerous about everything, but you should not be an expert in any of it. Because I think the second you start thinking, I know the best, I'm the best, you tend to hire followers and people that don't add to the conversation. They don't add to the potential. And I think because I was a management consultant for a few years, I got really good at having to always analyze a business for what it was, right? Like I didn't know how software companies were run. I didn't know how an automotive company was run, but you have to dive in so deep that you just start to realize there's basic business practices that run across any type of industry segment. So from an organizational theory standpoint, the same things go. Ops is the backbone, doesn't matter what you make, a car, a biscuit, flowers. Ops is the same thing over and over again. It's the same principles, just different sources and output, right? If you look at marketing, what kind of marketing do you need? That's really important, right? I'm not a marketer by trade. So I took the longest to try to figure out what kind of marketing do I think I need to support the company at this time? Um, same thing with sales, right? Like there's highly specialized areas where I feel like you as a CEO don't need to know about that. You just need to know that you have to admit you don't know about it. <laughs> Admit that you know enough to be dangerous so you could write a great job description and know where to find them. And then get after building the team around really good culture fits that have the strengths that you don't have. Um, I think that's one of my strengths that I didn't know I had until I started a business. I didn't realize how much team building I was doing in consulting, how much uh, business dissection I was doing until I really started my own. Um, in fact, a lot of the folks that I recruited in the ops and finance teams came from automotive. They did not come from food. So I think, you know, again, it's applied experience. It is. And you know what? I came from the automotive industry last, and obviously culturally there's something about those people, and that's why they came over, right? So I think that's a don't, – don't think you have to be an expert in the domain. No one will know your business better than you, not even somebody who has a like-for-like -like item. It's just different, and you have to accept that. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And what, what are you trying to build, right? It's not always too like, for example, um, it was a hard conversation, but Ross is no longer with the company. He stepped down as COO because he realized he didn't have the experience at the, anymore to keep going because he was really scrappy. He's the, he's the on the ground, do whatever it takes person, right? When you, when you start building structure and the team's getting unwieldy, right? There's like nine people on the ops team, right? Like they're all specialized. So every day, his brain had to switch between nine different target areas. He's like, I don't know this. Like, I can't do this. It takes a lot of courage to say that, right? So I brought in a new COO who actually I recruited from Oracle. And why? Because she's an incredible team person. She has a very complex division. It's a research division. And it's 900 different engineers from seven different sectors. So I was like, that's what I need. I need somebody who can speak seven languages, right? Like, and make them all work together. 
and that was more important than did she come from a biscuit factory, right? But sometimes you, maybe that is what you need. Maybe you need a biscuit factory person, right? Like you just got to think about what you need and stop worrying about does it look good on an org chart, right? That's the stuff you don't really learn until you get into practice. So that's a great question. Yeah, so I know a big issue in the food industry is shelf life. Now yours is frozen, so that's kind of a little bit of a longer shelf life. But has that ever been an issue that you ran into? And if so, how'd you handle it? So to your point, frozen, well, yes, because I think in the beginning I had I had visions that we could move out of frozen, right? Like I wanted to be shelf stable because there's so much more opportunity when you're not in perishables, right? Like potato chips example, right? Um, but I think there's a big problem in, in the American food system because if, if you look at the history of it, it's called the militarization, the industrialization of food post-World War II because of scarcity, because of people returning back to the workforce, because of price point sensitivity, because the southeast of America got decimated when tobacco and cotton didn't become prime crops. Um, the whole ecosystem of how we eat changed. And it had to be cheaper. It had to be more shelf stable because it'd be cheaper from a logistics standpoint. People got scared of frozen because all these weird, you know, frozen TV dinners started to happen. Like weird shit started to happen, right? So people started getting weird about it. So then the shelf stable movement came. It's like, okay, if you just add water, right? And everyone was like, yeah, yeah, add water, right? Oh, if you just sprinkle the nuts onto your dish, it's now healthier. Oh, yeah, yeah, add that. So that movement really started to overemphasize center aisle. If you go to a European grocery store, though, the emphasis is not on non refrigerated right? Like, vegetables are first, right? Like, I think there's a movement back to that. I think um, this concept of going back to real, right? People want convenience, but they're willing to seek other perimeters of the store to get it. So I think shelf life is important if you have to be, right? Like, if you're a cereal, if you're a cookie, if you're a chips, right? Like, Shelf stability is important, but I think there is a new acceptance and grocery retailers are really struggling with this now because people are willing to, they want fresh items. They don't want shit that, like, why does that shelf thing say four weeks out? Like, that's nuts. Even a um, great, great example was I hired my first, one of my first ops hires was this guy from Dave's Killer Bread because I was like, ah, he knows about shelf life. He knows how to get us into the center aisle. And I was like, how did they make a natural bread shelf stable for, I think it's a 21 day shelf life. And just so you know, natural bread has a four day shelf life. So I was like, how the hell did they do that? And he was like, just add sugar. And I was like, what the fuck? Right, like added sugar, that's what's killing Americans, right? And here's this fake natural brand that's saving prisoners and doing all the good stuff. And meanwhile, they're just like pouring refined sugar into the batter to increase shelf life, because sugar does that. So those are the types of questions that consumers are starting to ask, right? They're not dumb. Look at this whole movement against refined sugars and added sugar. It's because of that. That's a secret preservative. So I think we're at the cusp of that movement. I think all of you guys are the prime consumers. You guys are the change. You're the ones changing to go back to normal. Um, so don't be afraid to challenge that. There's ways around it. Um, small distributors are getting more and more creative around shelf stability. One big thing now, too, if you could deliver frozen and then slack it out, it's a huge way to add it. Um, so there's a lot of activity in that space. So I don't think, don't go out there saying, I want to start a food company and make sure that it's shelf stable, like unless you really believe the product needs to be. All right. Thank you so much. But uh, that does put, bring us to time. So everyone give our amazing speaker a round of applause. Thank you guys.